Good morning. The Lord be with you. The sun is shining. It's a good day today to be in worship. Uh, for those of you here in person and those joining online, I hope you meet God today. Thanks to those who are helping to lead worship today. Our liturgist is Lauren McElhaney. Our organist this morning is Nancy Slezak. Our acolyte today is Jackson Harper. Thanks, Jax. And our technical director this morning is Kyle Neville. Our chancel flowers today were given with love by Linda Smialowski in memory of Leroy Dobbins Beck, so we thank her for that. Today during worship, we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. For those of you here in person, if you didn't grab elements on your way in, uh, feel free to sneak out during the hymn and grab your elements. For those who are joining at home, whatever you have is fine and God will bless it. Today is the deadline for signing up for Valentine's for Veterans. Uh, we, have we met our goal? More than. More than. So let's keep going. Yeah. Wonderful. So if you would like to provide a little um, token of love to our veterans for Valentine's Day, you can see Karen or Dave Anderson. There are order forms in the uh, announcements. They also have uh, forms you can fill out as well. We are also uh, making Valentine's for community dinners. How was our progress on that, Judy? Coming along, all right, but we still need more. So there are materials downstairs. We want to give a Valentine to every guest at community dinners um, this Valentine's Day, which is our next serving day. The book club will also be meeting after worship today, and all are welcome for that conversation. And our kids have Sunday school after worship today as well. Ash Wednesday is coming up on Valentine's Day. I love when this happens. I love Ashentine's Day, I call it. Um, and we will be gathering for worship with our fellow Presbyterians on Wednesday, February 14th at 7 p.m. at Faith United Presbyterian Church. That is the one up by the mall. Uh, Mary Kitchen is serving as their covenant pastor, and so they are excited to host us. All are welcome. Uh, we will be serving communion, and there will be ashes as well. Again, that's on February 14th at 7 p.m. at Faith Church. So you can have your romantic dinner and then um, learn about your mortality. It's a, it's a wonderful day. <laughs> I love it, Susan. I don't know. <laughs> um, there is also Adults Night Out coming up on the 20th at 6 p.m. That's a Tuesday evening. You can sign up using the form on the deacon's table or by calling the church office. And Christian Ed will be hosting a game night, uh, an intergenerational game night on Friday, February 23rd at 6 p.m. down in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, refreshments and games will be provided, but if you have a game you love, feel free to bring it and bring a snack to share as well. Are there any other announcements to lift up this morning? Barb? Yes, yes. next month, um, for a book club next month, which will be the first Sunday in March, we're reading Little B, is that what it's called? Little B. Um, and Barb has books. It's one of the kits. And so if you are interested, you can see Barb and check out one of those books. Any other announcements this morning? Hearing none, let us prepare our hearts to worship God.
please rise and body your spirit and let us join together in our responsive call to worship. We gather in this sacred space to offer our thanks to God with all our hearts. We gather with this community of faith to follow Jesus who longs to lead us into life. We gather in these moments to learn all we can of grace from the Holy Spirit. Let us join together in our unison opening prayer. Holy God, you are above and beyond all things. With trust, hope, and humility in our hearts and minds, we gather to praise and worship you, the God who always hears and answers our prayers. Your promises are trustworthy and honorable. With thankful hearts and minds, we praise and worship you who understands and guides us. Amen. The Apostle Paul tells us that what is most essential to our conduct as Christians is not knowledge, but love. Yet too often we engage in our faith with our heads and not our hearts. Let us come before God and one another confessing just this as we join together in our unison prayer of confession. Let us pray. Holy God, we confess that we are a... Oh, no. Yep, do that one. <laughs> Let's start again. Holy God, too often we are reluctant disciples. We resist following you into the unknown and refuse to change the course of our lives. We are comfortable in our ignorance and our privilege. Forgive us, we pray, for clinging to power that isn't ours and for challenging yours. Help us, like your first followers, to drop everything to follow you. Hear this prayer, O oh God, and hear us as we lift our silent confessions before you now. Hear our prayers, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear and believe these words of grace. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. And so I promise you, in Jesus Christ, we are loved. In Jesus Christ, we are chosen. And in Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
let us now take a moment to share the peace of Christ with one another. They wait for the slide. <laughs> if any of our younger friends are joining at home, you're invited a little closer. My buddies are here. Okay, question. Have you ever um, gotten a new pet? We literally just did, literally just did it's true. Um, or have you ever had a baby visit your house? Maybe not. We'll go, we're going to go the pet route. Okay. Because I know you both, you both have pets. So, like, in our house, we love Legos, right? Gabe loves Legos. If we had a baby visit our house, or maybe a new puppy, would it be smart to leave the Legos on the ground? No. No. What might happen? Dog might chew them up. Yeah, might chew them up. Dog would eat them. Yeah, dog would eat them. Baby might eat them, too. Who knows? If you could, probably like hide them in their bed. could yeah, maybe. If you had a, a new pet in your house and you were eating a snack and you decided, oh, I have to go to the bathroom right now, would it be smart to leave your snack on the floor? No, just bring it with you. Bring it with you to the bathroom? <laughs> yeah. Set it down somewhere in there. What's gonna happen if you set it on the floor? The dog's gonna eat it. The dog's gonna eat it? Gonna eat Baby it. might eat it. Dogs, puppies and babies seem to like to eat things, huh? or might sit on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sometimes um, we have to change the way we do things, right? So if, we, if there's a new puppy in our house, we might have to rearrange. If there's a baby in the house or a new cat in our case, we might have to rearrange. We might have to move things, put things up higher, um, do things a little differently. Now. If we didn't, it'd be fine, right? Like, we can do whatever we want. You can leave your Legos on the floor if you want. You can leave your snack on the floor if you want. But if you do, that might harm the puppy, right? Not only would you lose your Legos or your snack, but it could also hurt the puppy or the baby. So sometimes we have to change our behavior not just for our own benefit, but for someone else. So in our Bible story today, it's kind of an interesting story. The Apostle Paul is talking about meat sacrificed to idols. Now, we don't do that anymore. But that was something that was done then, where people would go to a temple of another god, say the god of um, air. air, the air god. And they would go, and, and in their mind, the air god really loved uh, bacon. So they would take bacon to the temple of the air god, and give it to the God. But the air God is not really there, right? It was more of a, a religious ceremony. So what, you know what they would do with the bacon afterwards? They'd eat it, because it's delicious. Like, yeah, they should. If they didn't eat the bacon, would the wind just get it? Maybe the wind would take it away. Yeah, I don't know. When God gets rid of it? Yeah. So in our story, and where this story takes place, there were people who believed in Jesus. There were people who believed in the God of air. There were people who believed in all different kinds of gods and goddesses. And they would intermingle. And so sometimes a person who believed in Jesus would go to an event at the temple of the God of air, maybe a meeting. And afterwards they said, hey, would you like some bacon? Now, some people said, yeah, bacon's delicious. I do want bacon. Other people said, well, that bacon has been given to this God, so we shouldn't eat it. And they started to argue. Can you believe that? People in churches arguing? <laughs> even I, can't, I can't believe even more. Churches arguing over bacon. Churches arguing over bacon. I know, that seems unfathomable. Yeah. But so they were arguing. Some people said, it's okay if we eat this meat. And some people said, no, 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 it's not. Churches so they, don't eat the bacon. Well, they, so they asked Paul. They said, what should we do? Can we eat the meat or not? And Paul said, well, you can. Kind of like you could leave your Legos on the floor. You can. But 
it might hurt someone else because you know that it's just bacon. But for someone else, they might not realize that. They might still think that bacon is given to the air god and that is not right. And so it could lead them away from Jesus. So Paul basically says you can, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. And so you should make the sacrifice for other people, which means you probably shouldn't eat the bacon. Now, if someone told you you can't eat bacon, how would that make you? Yeah, that would, yeah. <laughs> It wouldn't make you feel good, right? No, because no, it's delicious. But sometimes we have to sacrifice. We have to do things differently. We have to let go of something we like for the betterment of others. So we um, pick up our toys. We pick up our snacks. This is why we get vaccines to help keep other people safe. This is why when we're driving, we use all of our good safety. We wear our seatbelt, not just to protect you, but to protect other people in the car. We do things, we make sacrifices for other people as well. That's what God calls us to do, to not just think about what we want, but to think about what's best for everybody. So that's what I'd like you to think about this week. What is not, not just what I want, but what is good for everybody? What is good for my family? What is good for my class? What is good for my church? And that's what we should do, even if it means sacrificing. Okay? All right, can you pray with me? Thank you, God for loving us and loving others. Help us to do what is right for all of your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God, you spoke your word and revealed your good news in Jesus, the Christ. Fill all creation with that word again, so that by proclaiming your joyful promises and singing of your glorious hope to all peoples, we may become one living body, your presence on the earth. Amen. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 111 from the Common English Bible. This is a song of praise for God's wonderful works. Listen now for God's word to us. Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord with all my heart in the company of those who do right in the congregation. The works of the Lord are magnificent. They are treasured by all who desire them. God's deeds are majestic and glorious. God's righteousness stands forever. God is famous for his wondrous works. The Lord is full of mercy and compassion. God gives food to those who honor him. God remembers his covenant forever. God proclaimed his powerful deeds to his people and gave them what had belonged to other nations. God's handiwork is honesty and justice. All God's rules are trustworthy. They are established always and forever. They are fulfilled with truth and right doing. God sent redemption for his people. God commanded that his covenant last forever. Holy and awesome is God's name. Fear of the Lord is where wisdom begins. Sure knowledge is for all who keep God's laws. God's praise lasts forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our epistle reading today comes from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, chapter 8, verses 1 through 13, also from the Common English Bible. Here, Paul uses the example of meat offered to idols to illuminate what it means to live in community. Listen again for God's word to us. Now concerning meat that has been sacrificed to a false god, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes people arrogant, but love builds people up. If anyone thinks they know something, they don't yet know as much as they should know. But if someone loves God, then they are known by God. So concerning the actual food involved in these sacrifices to false gods, we know that a false god isn't anything in this world and that there is no God except for the one God. Granted, there are so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as there are many gods and many lords. However, for us believers, there is one God the Father. All things come from him, and we belong to him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things exist through him, and we live through him. But... Not everybody knows this. Some are eating this food as though it really is food sacrificed to a real idol because they were used to idol worship until now. Their conscience is weak because it has been damaged. Food won't bring us close to God. We're not missing out if we don't eat and we don't have any advantage if we do eat. But watch out or else this freedom of yours might be a problem for those who are weak. Suppose someone sees you, the person who has knowledge, eating in an idol's temple. Won't the person with a weak conscience be encouraged to eat the meat sacrificed to false gods? The weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. You sin against Christ, if you sin against your brothers and sisters and hurt their weak consciences in this way. This is why if food causes the downfall of my brother or sister, I won't eat meat ever again, or else I may cause my brother or sister to fall. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word word which is so far removed from us geographically and culturally, yet is so relevant today. Open our minds and our ears to hear what you have to say to us today, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts gathered together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Twice each semester when I was in seminary, we would share chapel services with our neighbors down the road, Wartburg Lutheran Seminary. Once they would host us on their campus and once we would host them on ours. These services always included communion. And we took communion by intinction. So we would go forward, we're handed a piece of bread, which we then dipped in a common cup before eating, you know. And you'd think I would have figured it out after a couple of visits, but every single time I was at Wartburg, I was caught off guard by the wine. Now, I know many of you have been part of traditions that use wine for communion, and I definitely know that when we were solely bring your own elements for communion, some of you did enjoy the fermented stuff. But I'm a lifelong Presbyterian, so for me, grape juice, especially Welch's, is what I'm used to when taking communion. In fact, in our tradition, our book of order says that wine with alcohol may be served during the Lord's Supper, but non-alcoholic wine or grape juice must be served. Of the things that various flavors of Christians like to argue about, sacraments are high on this list. And this includes the wine versus grape juice debate. 
And of all the things we fight about, though, this is a relatively new squabble. It wasn't until 1869 when Methodist dentist and staunch prohibitionist Thomas Bramwell Welch developed a method of pasteurization to prevent the fermentation of grape juice. When he did this, he persuaded local churches to adopt this non-alcoholic wine substitute for use during communion, and he called it Dr. Welch's unfermented wine. We call it Welch's grape juice today. As with many of the things we bicker about, there are valid arguments on both sides of this debate. We can be certain that Jesus did not have Welch's grape juice at his last supper with his disciples. It was wine. And so some argue that wine should be used during the Lord's Supper because it's more authentic. But then others ask, what about those who can't or shouldn't have wine? And the debate continues. Now, believe it or not, disagreement among believers is not a modern phenomenon, nor is a faith community's unwillingness to embrace change. Most of Paul's letters address just this. He wrote to communities in the midst of conflict. At first glance, we see that chapter 8 from Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church clearly addresses conflict. But it is a conflict which seems incredibly far removed from our own reality. Corinth was a bustling port town, halfway between Athens and Sparta. This meant that it was home to a diverse population and had a variety of cultural, ethnic, religious, and social influences as people passed through from all over the ancient world. And so, of course, that means that the Corinthian church congregation was also quite diverse. Paul devotes an entire chapter, which it was on chapters when he wrote it, but an entire chapter of this letter is devoted to the question of eating meat previously sacrificed to idols. Now, due to cost, meat was not easily accessible. Most people were vegetarian, not by choice. The most common way to add meat to your diet would have been through participation in cultic rituals or dinners. Dr. G. Hay Park, assistant professor of New Testament at the Seminary of the Southwest, explains that in the ancient Mediterranean world, religious life was not quite separate from civic and social life. So she says it is likely that some of these Corinthians, the Corinthian church folks, joined these cultic events without hesitation as an extension of their civic and social life and consumed food there. She says they had the knowledge that their monotheistic faith would not be impeded by such activities. So in other words, a prominent businessman wouldn't miss the monthly rotary meeting at the temple, temple of Demeter, and he'd be silly not to stay for the prime rib dinner afterwards. And Paul explains because he is a man of faith. He knows that there is one true God and that these other gods aren't real. This means that the religious rite surrounding the offering of this meat is invalid. And so it's totally fine for him to partake. The issue for Paul is not the meat itself, nor is it the freedom of the individual to consume it. Yeah, you can, he says. But the issue is perception, which was creating a power dynamic within the church community, and it was harming some. Not everyone in the congregation knew what the Rotarian knew, that the meat was fine to eat because its sacrifice was invalid. Paul describes these as weak in conscience, not weak in faith, weak in conscience. Perhaps they were the ones who were new to the faith. They could have been younger members of the community, those who were still learning. 
and they could be led astray. So in other words, Paul is saying, you and I know that there is only one God. You and I know that attendance at a dinner does not impact your faith. But others don't yet understand this. And when they see you at the temple eating, they may be encouraged to engage in the same behavior, which, while unproblematic for you, could be incredibly detrimental for them. Therefore, Paul says, even though you know better, it is in the best interest of the community that you do not partake in these meals and gatherings, lest you unintentionally lead someone away from the faith. And this is why, and this is my favorite line in this passage, Paul says, if food causes the downfall of my siblings, I won't eat meat ever again, or else I may cause them to fall. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Which brings us back to the wine versus grape juice debate. Most people are fine with a sip of wine during church, but not everyone is. I am particularly mindful of those in recovery for alcoholism. For some, it's fine. This practice would have no impact. But for others, even the smell of wine could trigger a relapse. And because we care about one another, we are willing to make the sacrifice, to check our individualism at the door in favor of what best builds up the community. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Now, while most of us will never have to deal with the question of meat sacrificed to idols, the sentiment behind, behind Paul's words are applicable in so many situations, not just wine versus grape juice. We saw this especially at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, when we engaged in practices such as wearing masks and getting vaccines, not necessarily for our own benefit, but for those more susceptible to the virus. We use safety precautions such as driving under the speed limit or stopping at red lights, not because we have to, but because it is what is best for the community. And the examples are endless, things that we do, things that we sacrifice for others. And really, it all boils down to the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us. Love God, love your neighbors, and love yourself. Dr. Park highlights that in this section of the letter, Paul is speaking not as a theologian, but as a pastor. He says concepts like freedom and liberty and individualism ring hollow in the shadow of real relationships with real people. He was dealing with a community in crisis. And his answer, according to Park, is that the key to community building the key to bringing this congregation together is not knowledge, but love. Harmony is not the state of agreeing with each other on certain knowledge, but of loving each other amidst degreement, disagreement. Now, I wasn't joking a couple weeks ago when I said that I have one sermon and it's about love. Here it is. But for me, love is foundational to everything, and I think Paul agrees. We have experienced God's unconditional love. And here in this strange chapter, Paul reminds us of what it looks like to love one another similarly. Sometimes it requires sacrifice. Sometimes it requires setting aside our own comforts and desires. Sometimes it requires discomfort and challenge. But it is what we are called to do for one another. May we be so willing. Amen. Please remain seated as we sing our response together.
What we give individually may not seem like much, but what we give together makes a discernible difference in our community as we work toward the reconciliation of all. To financially support the mission and ministry of Hill Church, you are invited to place your offerings in the plates near the entrances, drop them off during the week, mail them to the church, or give electronically. Please rise and body or spirit as we join together in our unison prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Loving God, you are never far from us. You are as close as our breathing. We recognize you as the one who heals the wounded spirit and gives new life to the brokenhearted. We offer our gifts to you, O oh God, as a sign of our commitment to your grace and authority. Take us and use us and all that we have so that the kingdom of heaven will be realized on earth. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. We come together now to share our joys and our concerns as a community of faith. Today we continue uh, to pray for B as she grieves the death of her sister Vivian. Um, she was laid to rest this week, and but we know that grief lingers, and so we are with you, B, as you miss your sister. We also pray for the family of Margaret Drobesko. Um, she is Mary Campbell's mother. I think some of you know Mary Campbell. She passed away this week as well, and so we pray for them in their grief. We lift up Chris Leroy, who is having eye surgery tomorrow, and um, the doctors forewarned her that there may be some complications, so uh, we pray that that is not the case and that surgery goes well. We continue to lift up Karen Bryson's daughter, Jen, as she's going through treatment for cancer. She is tolerating the radiation better, and so um, prayers that things continue to go in that direction. We lift up all of those we love who are in nursing homes and care facilities and also those who are caregivers. Last week, we prayed for a young man named Nick, 16-year-old um, son of a co-worker of Christy Davis, who was diagnosed with testicular cancer. He had surgery this week, and they have discovered that it is stage four, and that it is in his blood and his bones as well. And so they're just receiving bad news after bad news after bad news. Um, they do have a treatment plan in place, and they're hoping that because of his age that he will be able to fight it. But we continue to pray for Nick and for his parents and those who care for him. Uh, on a... More joyful note, David and I um, have a new great niece named Sophia, Sophia Ann Marie Avalos. She was born on January 31st to our niece, Sydney, and she's beautiful and has lots of hair. So we celebrate uh, new life. Are there other joys or concerns to lift up this morning? The girl I work with, who is a good friend, Mackenzie, had a baby this week, which is a joy, but she was only at 32 weeks. Um, so the baby's only three pounds, 13 ounces, Bo. So he'll be in the NICU. So if we can continue prayers for him and for the family. Absolutely. Thank you. I wanted to report that David's doing better. Hopefully he's headed back to rehab this week and maybe home in two or three weeks. So okay, <laughs> we're gonna try it again. And we have good news, a few of you know, but most of you don't, we are expecting another grandbaby, Michaela and Ross are expecting in August. It's early yet, but everything looks good so far. 
for an, uh, what do they call her, an extremely old? Geriatric. <laughs> yes, I, I know. <laughs> geriatric pregnancy. I think they call it advanced maternal age now. They try to be nice about it, but yeah. Well, congratulations, Grandma. That's exciting. Two joys. One, my cousin had a baby girl on the February 1st. She was nine pounds, five ounces. She was a big baby. Bless that mama. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're all doing great, and she is absolutely adorable. And we celebrated my neighbor's daughter's 16th birthday. Officially, it's not till Tuesday, but she had her party yesterday, and the kids had so much fun. Thank you. Lots of babies. That's exciting. Other joys or concerns to lift up this morning? Hearing none, then I invite you to get your communion elements ready. Thank you, Greg. We come, we come to this table by divine invitation. Just as he did millennia ago, Jesus still invites us to sit down at this table to receive a meal that satisfies the soul and contains the promise of eternal life. Here at Hill Church, we practice an open communion, which means you do not have to be a member of this church or any church to partake of this meal. If it was okay for Jesus to share his table with those who questioned and those who doubted, and even the one who betrayed him to death, then surely we are welcome too. So come, if you desire to be fed, come to this table just as you are. The divine invitation is for you. You are loved and you are home. All are welcome here. Will you please join me in the great prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You are indeed to be praised, O God. You poured your spirit into chaos, and with your word raised up towering peaks kissing the sky. All was formed and offered to us, but we listened to sin and death, impostors calling themselves gods. Because you knew us, you continued to send prophets to us to call us back to you. But we said, what do you have to do with us? And ignored their words. So in time, you sent your child to us so that we might know who you are. By his humility, he teaches us to serve others. By his weakness, he models the strength to challenge injustice. By his silence, he helps us to listen to hearts, not just words. By his death, he shows us how to trust in resurrection hope. As you pour out your Holy Spirit on those gathered in worship, you provide the bread and the cup from the simple gifts of creation, blessing them with your love. As we eat of the broken bread, may it bring us closer to all we are called to serve, the hungry, the hurting, the cold, the oppressed. As we drink from the cup, may its grace rise up to go out and become carers of the forgotten. May it help us to be workers of justice and builders of shelters. And when we gather in the company of our siblings of every time and place around your table, we will give thanks with our whole hearts, God in community, holy in one. We thank you for these gifts and for this community of faith. We ask that you hear the prayers we have lifted before you, those named aloud and those on our hearts. And hear us now, O God, as with grateful hearts, as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night when he was betrayed, Jesus sat and ate with his disciples. And during that meal, he took the bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he poured into the cup, saying, this is the covenant of my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of it often. And when you do, remember me. So every time we gather at the table and we eat of the bread and we drink of the cup, regardless of what the elements are, we are reminded of the love of Christ, we are reminded of the sacrifice he made, and we are reminded that we are called to make that sacrifice as well. Friends, the gifts of God for the people of God have been prepared with love. Let us partake together. Please rise and body our spirit. <laughs> Sorry. Please rise and body our spirit as we join together in our unison prayer after communion. Eternal God, you have richly fed us and refreshed our souls. Help us to love with our whole hearts, truly believing in you, so that we may live according to your will. Nourished and fed, May we go out into the world to nourish others. Amen.
before a world preparing for God's glorious reign of peace where time and tears will be no more. God's glorious reign of peace. May you go in peace. May you go in love. May you go knowing that sacrifices have been made for you out of love. And may you do the same for others. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God that will never let you go and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.